I took a two day break, but I took the wrong two days, right? I was supposed to take Saturday and Sunday, um, but I took Friday and Saturday, which means I have to do Friday's day today, which is why I am here on a Sunday night. But I had my two days of break, everybody. I just had the wrong two days. What happened Friday was it was date night and I didn't get home too late. And then Saturday I had a funeral and a wedding on the same day. So that kind of consumed a lot of my day. And then that evening I was doing stuff that I would have been doing in the daytime. So we didn't have a chance to come out here, but I am here now for anybody that wants to join me. I don't know who will or who won't, but we will see. So far, I have nobody. It is, I don't know, it is kind of late, it's almost midnight. I'm heading toward that midnight hour. It will probably be after midnight when I finish, right? Because they're usually at least 20 minutes or so. But we will see. I will give this only a couple more minutes. Yeah, about two more minutes and then we'll get started. Good stuff today, good stuff. Good, good stuff. All right, let's see, how long have I been waiting? It feels like forever, but it's not that much longer. But I'm gonna give it like 45 seconds, guys. And then we're going to get started. It's a long day today, too. But I made it work. I had a lot to do today. All right, guys, I do have one person that joined me. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Not quite sure who you are because I can't see your picture that well, but welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining me. You can say hi, and that way I'll know who you are. Um, but we are going to get started. We are picking up from where we left off last time. We left off at Exodus uh, 4, and yes, we are in a whole new book. We are in Exodus. And if you remember in Exodus 4, um, Moses had went to the elders um, in the camp. And in the camp, he showed them um, the miracles that the Lord had given him. So he put his hand in his uh, jacket and brought it out. And it was leprous and then it wasn't leprous. Um, he threw his um, staff on the ground and it became a snake. Um, and so the elders believed him, um, but he still had excuses, right? Um, at the end of chapter four, he still had excuses about why he couldn't do it. Even after God is showing him, I'm giving you the power to do miracles. He still had, uh, some obsession, um, with these excuses. Um, and because he, um, still had excuses, God said, look. Tell you what I'm going to do is I'm going to see you with your brother. Everything's going to be okay. The Lord got kind of uh, raw with him. Like, who gave you your voice in the first place? Basically is what he's saying. Um, but we're going to uh, uh, start today with chapter 5. And in chapter 5, um, um, Moses finally gets an opportunity to go and approach the Pharaoh. Now, 
you have to keep in mind, and this is sometimes um, hard to remember because we don't have, well, at least it's hard to remember for me because we don't have like most his childhood anywhere. So all we have is that his mother left him on the Nile, right? And that Pharaoh's daughter found him and that they got his mother to nurse him. Um, but then she returned him to Pharaoh's daughter after he was of um, weaning age. Um, and then from there, all we know is it goes to him killing the man, right? And so there's no childhood of Moses given to us. So sometimes it's hard to remember that Moses grew up as a prince, basically. He was the princess's daughter. He was um, uh, the Pharaoh's grandson, right? Um, so he was very, pretty much high status. And um, now he has to go back to these same people. Very likely the Pharaoh he went to was raised with him as a brother, right? Um, or as an uncle. It all depends age-wise. Um, so, but most people believe it was raised to him. Uh, he was raised with this person as a brother. Um, so just imagine he's got to go back to a place that he ran away from because he killed a man and people knew about it. And that Pharaoh wanted to get him for doing that, remember. Um, he went from there um, to having to go back to the same people that he grew up with 40 years later. He's got to go back to the same people. Um, it doesn't say if his, um, uh, I guess we would call it adoptive mother, right? It doesn't say if his adoptive mother was still living. It doesn't say how his family did or did not receive him when he came back. But this was his family. This was where he grew up. Um, and so he's going back to territory that he knows very well. Now, Aaron is going to a foreign place, right? Aaron only knows it through slavery. But, you know, Moses was in the palace. He was, you know, being raised by the Pharaoh. He had access um, to everything a grandson of Pharaoh would have access to. Um, and now he's got to go and talk to this Pharaoh that very likely could have been his brother and say, let my people go. So what happens? He goes, he tells the Pharaoh, and it, it starts off as a conversation, just let my people go worship for three days in the wilderness. And so that's how the conversation starts. Um, but the Pharaoh, listen to what he says um, in chapter 5, verse 2. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go, right? So Pharaoh is like, I don't, I don't even know who you're talking about. Who is the Lord? Who is this that I should be bowing to him, right? That was the Pharaoh's um, sort of take on things. But what you find, um, it, as we read down, um, we find out that the, the take that the Pharaoh had on things was really being orchestrated by God. God is purposely telling uh, Moses ahead of time, ahead of everything that's going to happen. He's telling him that um, um, what he's going to do. He's already told him what he's going to do, but it doesn't help how Moses, Moses feels. Um, and so what happens is the Pharaoh is like, these people too lazy. If they got time to be talking about worshiping and going three days somewhere, it's because they're not working enough. And listen to what verse 9 says. It says, make the work harder for the people so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. And so I thought about this scripture and was like, whoa, the enemy is still doing this today. He is making everything that we go through harder, everything that we deal with on a daily basis harder so that as we're dealing with it, we get so consumed by life, so consumed by the things that we're going through, just so consumed by our day-to-day -day activity. It's hard and it feels harder today than it was yesterday. But understand, that's a trick of the enemy to get you so consumed with everything that you're going through that you don't get consumed with God. That you are no longer caring about what God thinks or what God uh, wants you to do. You're so consumed with 
how you feel, come on now, that you miss totally what God is trying to do in your life. And so this was the Israelites. And trust me, uh, the slave drivers did their job. They started uh, riding them harder. They took straw away from them and said, now you can go uh, find your own straw, which of course would take longer, but they're requiring the same quota. So if you was making 20 bricks yesterday and I was giving you straw, you better make 20 bricks today, even though I'm not giving you the straw and you got to go find it yourself. Well, what happened? Look at verse, um, uh, I think verse 20. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, may the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hands to kill us. So remember, these was the same people that's like, yes, go tell Pharaoh to let us go. Now when Moses actually does it and they see the turnout, they turn on Moses. They say, may you be found obnoxious because I, we can't believe that you would even put us in a situation like this, that you would put us in a place where we now got to work harder. You know, you know how people are before you came, things was easier before you came. Uh, he didn't treat us like this before you came. Uh, we could get our work done and still have time to spend with our family. Right. Um, so they trust me. They were not happy with Moses at all. And Moses did something that we don't do. Moses actually cried out and asked God why. And a lot of people don't ask God why. But I, I believe we should follow the models of the Bible, right? Listen to what Moses goes and does. Moses returned. I'm in verse 22 of chapter 5. Moses returned to the Lord and said, Why, Lord? Why have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I sent, I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Um, can you imagine telling God that? And you have not done what you said you was going to do. That's basically what Moses said. You have not rescued your people at all. You have not done what you said you were going to do. And so because of this, what happens is God answers this prayer and it starts with chapter six. Uh, but God answers this prayer of Moses. It doesn't even seem like a prayer that should get answered, right? It seems like God should be angry, frustrated, right? Seems like it could be like, I'm not giving him nothing and I'm not doing nothing for him if this is the way he's going to talk to me, right? But listen to what God says. The Lord then in chapter six, verse one, then the Lord said to Moses, now you will see what I will do to the Pharaoh because of my mighty hand, he will let them go because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. Um, and then he says, I am the Lord. He's reminding him. I appeared to Abraham. I appeared to Isaac. I appeared to Jacob as God almighty, but my name is the Lord. In other words, I have rule over you. I did not make myself fully known to them. I also established my covenant with them um, to give them the land of Canaan where they resided as foreigners. And so God is reestablishing the covenant that he had with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's reestablishing it here with Moses, making sure that Moses understands, listen, don't get beside yourself. I'm the same God that brought all of them through all the things that they went through. Please know that I can bring you out too. Um, so Moses uh, went back to the Israelites. And um, in, in this passage, again, God tells him all the details again. Um, you know, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. He's not going to do it, but don't worry. There's going to be plague after plague after plague. And eventually he's going to have no choice but to run you guys out of there. And so he goes back, Moses, and tells this to the elders again, but the elders don't want to hear it. Uh -huh. He went back to the Israelites and told them all of this wonderful, exciting news that he just got from God. But the Israelites are like, mm -mm, ain't even trying to hear it. Nope, you are already. Why? You know why? Because it's just like the Pharaoh said. 
make the work harder for the people so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. They were so uh, attentive on what had happened that they got more work that they never stopped to think about what God was doing and how awesome it was. They just got so consumed in what was happening then, what was happening at that very second that they could not get enthused about what God was going to do, even after Moses rolled it all out and told them. So what happened? God um, goes through now the family tree. Remember, he's renewed the covenant with Moses. And so now that the covenant is renewed, he needs to go through this family tree, make sure Moses knows where he lands and says, look, these are the family records of all of those. And this is what I'm going to do. Um, in verse 26, um, he says, bring the Israelites out of Egypt by their divisions. So now he's starting to give them specifics, right? So we don't want you to just say, everybody run, run for your life. That's not what we're going to say. No, you're going to bring them out orderly. Trust me, God is still prophesying to Moses, saying this is going to happen. And now this is how it's going to happen, right? He starts giving more detail to Moses and starts telling them that he needs to bring the tribes out one by one. Um, and as he does that, bringing them out by their divisions, um, it was going to be a blessing for them. All right, so we go on to chapter 7. Um, and right before chapter 7, at the end of chapter 6, God encourages Moses. Um, he gives him encouraging words and tells him, look, understand, this is what's going to happen, but I'm with you every step of the way. So um, in chapter 7, he goes uh, again to tell them, and this is where he specifically says um, in verse 3 of chapter 7, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Um, so he's telling them right away, you're going to say it's like a failed mission almost. You're going to say it. You're going to prophesy it. You're going to, you're going to uh, do whatever, but Pharaoh is not going to listen to you. I am going to harden his heart. And um, you may ask, like, that sounds weird. Why would God harden the heart of the Pharaoh so that he couldn't answer favorably if he wanted to. Well, God knew the wickedness of Pharaoh in the first place and that if he had said yes, it would only be yes for a moment. God was working a bigger plan where it would be yes for a lifetime. Ooh, we, that's a message right there. Sometimes we pray for yes for a moment, but God is working a bigger plan. Yes for a lifetime. God is trying to get you in a position where it doesn't matter um, uh, what you've been through or what you're going through, it's going to be yes for a lifetime. So he sometimes purposely um, makes things harder than you think they should be so that you can see how great God is at working out hard things and then you will submit yourself even the more. And so they finally go to Pharaoh um, again and he says, let my people go. Um, and Pharaoh says no because his heart was hardened by God. Um, they threw down their staff and it became a snow, snake. But the magicians threw down their staff too. And their staffs became snake. But listen to snakes as well. But listen to this. Their staff, um, their sticks or whatever they threw down that became snakes, um, Aaron's snake actually ate up all of their snakes um let me tell you something as i was reading that a couple things came to mind first of all um the enemy the enemy can imitate everything but victory you got it the enemy can imitate everything but victory right so he he can make it look like victory but he doesn't he can't imitate victory and so here you have Aaron throwing the staff down. It becomes a snake. They throw sticks or staffs or whatever. They become snakes too, but they can't imitate the victory, which is Aaron's uh, snake eating up all of their snakes. They can't imitate that victory, right? And so after they do that and after um, the Pharaoh sees that his magicians can imitate what was done, he hardens his heart again, or as we know, 
And look at how it's even said. The Pharaoh's heart became hard, right? So it wasn't even something naturally that he was looking at. His heart just became hard, right? So now Pharaoh refused to let him go. So what happens? Well, the first plague happens. Water to blood, right? And so all the water in the Nile turned to blood. And it was so horrible that everything in there started to die. And then you just imagine the smell of death, right? And so now the whole city just smells like death and blood and gross and ooh, right? A whole river became blood. Um, and so what happens? Well, of course, they cry out as they always do. Um, and um, in verse... Uh, 17 it says this is what the Lord says by this you will know that I am the Lord with the staff that is in my hand I will strike the water of the Nile and it will be changed into blood the fish in the Nile will die and the river will stink the Egyptians will not be able to drink its water and that's exactly what, it ha what happened exactly what happened and then after that uh, the Pharaoh uh, sort of cries out his magicians do the same thing they can turn water into blood as well. And he like, oh, that's just some fanciful trick. Y'all ain't fooling me. That's just some trick y'all doing. So his heart gets hard again. Um, look in chapter 8, though. In chapter 8 is the plague of the frogs. And now there are frogs everywhere. The Nile is full of frogs. Um, but not just at the Nile. Um, not just, you know, on the riverbank. But it says frogs were going to be everywhere, like in their bedrooms, in their kitchen, in their flower, in just you name where a frog shouldn't be. And that's where frogs were going to be in multiplicity, right? I can't even imagine this. I don't even want to imagine this. Just frogs everywhere you look, just frogs, just layers and layers of frogs. Um, so again, Pharaoh says, look, tell me what you need. Um, and I got it. Oh, you want to go worship? Okay, fine. You can go worship. Just make this all go away, right? Um, and, you know, he's uh, Moses is like, tell me when. And he's like, just tomorrow, right? So Moses is like, look, I'm going to pray to the Lord, and tomorrow you won't have this frog problem. And he did. He prayed to the Lord. The frogs all died. They had to put them in a big heap. Um, and I don't know if they were, you know, what they were going to do, but it says they piled them up in a big heap uh, because all the frogs died. But then what do you think happened? The Pharaoh changed his mind and hardened his heart. And so because his heart was hardened, um, uh, again, they moved to the next plague. Um, and so now we're on the third plague. So we've had water to blood, right? And we've had frogs. The third plague is gnats, um, and I don't know if you you know knew, but we had a little like gnat infestation in Michigan um, this past summer. But it was nothing like the gnats that were there. If they were everywhere, like you couldn't just wave it away. Just it was everywhere, like everywhere gnats. You couldn't go and get relief from anywhere uh, for these gnats. Um, and then this is the first time this third plague. Verse 18, but when the magicians tried to produce nets by their secret arts, they couldn't. So they, re, you know, they replicated the first two plagues. And so Moses, um, you know, probably was confused, like, ah, how are you going to let them do this, right? Um, the Pharaoh, however, took that as a sign as my magicians is working magic and y'all some kind of way working magic, right? Um, but really... Um, when the magicians realized that they could not make gnats come on the earth, they couldn't do that. Um, what do they say? In verse, oh, what verse is this? 19. It says, the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. This is the finger of God. The magicians knew that this was God. This is the finger of God because we can't even duplicate it. We can't do nothing with it. And what I wrote on the side here is the enemy can only go so far. Ooh, wee, I love it. The enemy can only go so far. 
I mean, the enemy is stand toe to toe with you, but the longer that you stand in the word, the enemy can't continue to stand toe to toe with you. At some point, the enemy going to fall off because you're doing the right thing and the enemy's not going to do that. Um, and so you need to realize that the enemy can only go so far. It's only so far that the enemy can go. What happens next? Well, of course, you know, Pharaoh hardens his heart. He does not let the people go to the wilderness, even though he promised that he would. And so the fourth plague and the last plague um, that we're going to talk about today happens, and that's flies. And Oh, Lord knows I can't stand flies. I can't even or nor do I want to try to imagine what this looks like. Just flies everywhere. Just, just flies everywhere. Just flies. Oh, he said... Um, there was going to be so many flies that I'm just going to lie on the ground with flies. Just, just, you right, you got to get a visual. So did you understand this wasn't like one or two flies that you could shoo away. This was flies everywhere. Layers of flies just laying on the ground, right? Just, oh, it was horrible. Um, but listen, this was the awesome part. Um, verse 22. Um, and you need to get this, right? Um, <clears throat> um, and this is our memory verse. So chapter eight, verse 22, chapter eight, verse 22. But on that day, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there so that you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. This sign will occur tomorrow. So for the first time, because when the Nile was turned to blood, the, the Israelites had to deal with that the same way the Egyptians did. Uh, when the frogs came, the Israelites had frogs the same way the Egyptians did. When the gnats came, the Israelites had gnats the same way the Egyptians did. But when the flies came, right, when the enemy could no longer go, uh, you know, another step with you, right? Because he realized, oh, this person is anointed by God, right? When the enemy was like, uh-uh, God said, now I'm going to really show you something. Now, not only are there going to be flies that plague you, but I'm going to protect my people. It's like they had a bubble over them. No flies came to their territory. They couldn't be touched at all with what was going on with the enemy's camp. It didn't even matter that they were going through. God got me as a hedge of protection around me. And there was nothing um, that, you know, the Egyptians could even do about it. Um, and so here you have the first plague that did not touch the Israelites. They weren't touched by this plague. They didn't have to worry about it. I imagine they were looking over there like, ooh, we, y'all show going through, right? It did not touch their household. And it says, um, the Lord did this, in case you wanted to know. The Lord did this, right? Why? Because I will make a distinction between my people and your people. This sign will occur tomorrow. Listen, God's saying, I want to make a distinction. Is you is or is you ain't with me, right? I want to make a distinction. And so the distinction I'm making is everybody that's with me will not go through to this level. And I believe that's a prophecy for somebody today, somebody that's scared, somebody that's discouraged, somebody that's all caught up in this political mess that's going on. And you're like, ooh, we, I believe God's going to make a distinction for his people, a distinction where we will not go through it at the same level that others are going through. Why? Because we are God's people and he's going to make a distinction for us. Remember, that is the memory verse, chapter 8, verse 22 and 23, verses 22 and 23. Um, it goes on from there where Pharaoh tried to compromise. He's like, well, okay. What if I just give your people some time to, you know, worship their God right here? Why y'all got to go to the mountains to do it? Just do it right here. But the Lord said no, right? And so therefore Moses and Aaron had to say no um, to this compromise. Um, and I love um, um, Moses to death for this next answer. So if you look at verse 28, Pharaoh says, I will let you go to offer sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, 
but you must not go very far. Now pray for me. And what does Moses do? He doesn't pray for him. Listen, this is the Pharaoh saying, pray for me. And this is Moses saying, um, as soon as I leave you, I will pray to the Lord. And tomorrow the flies will leave Pharaoh and his officials and his people. I'm going to pray to the Lord that he uplifts his cup. But I'm not praying for you because you ain't right, right? I'm not praying for you. Moses said, look, I'm not praying for you. I'm praying that the situation that you're in actually comes to an end, but I'm not praying for you. Um, so we end this chapter again with Pharaoh hardening his heart and saying, nope, I will not let my people go. I will not do it. Um, and we're going to see as time goes on that there will be more plagues. We're only on number four and they are 10 plagues total. But listen, God is going to show himself strong in the next few chapters. You want to be there for this. You want to read the next few chapters so that we can all be on one accord. So remember, you're reading for yourself. You're not concentrating on me doing the uh, recap every day. You're not just only doing that, but you are making sure that you are reading for yourself as well. Uh, we're going to pick up here with the rest of the plagues. Um, tomorrow, we're going to go through uh, chapter 9 all the way to the 10th plague, all the way to the Passover. And we're going to talk more about it when we get there. So until next time, I love you. You be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.